Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you wanna be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now, so maybe maybe be a lawyer, call him up, say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight, and like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number 8. Ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there, whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learning useful skills and could be a great career choice, it could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, war of the bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially through the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Modo I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes, <laughs> ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil, get him. Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Rune, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples, as sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. Number five. Rebel Princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The Queen's younger sister was known as the Rebel Princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own
own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris I. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others, not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. 
At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift? But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work. Even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. 
Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number 5. Queen Isabella I the Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number 2, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. 
And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over three 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner Piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you having a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. 
all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number 6. We are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. Number five original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three. Brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, 
this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aten. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aten was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues, okay? Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace, just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know, just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head, that's sad, it's tragic. And another professor died in 1936, shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial, so somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest, horrible, that's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, 
This one's pretty juicy, listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? While Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if your family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five. George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages. Full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905 he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me. That was me. You want to see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still, it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also, so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. 
Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. Yeah. At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop at animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built. So he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Number 10, Charlie Chaplin. This might have been the biggest shocker to me tonight. I had no idea he married and had relations with so many girls under the age of 20 when he was uh, much older than them. So in 1918, for starters, Chaplin hastily tied the knot with 17-year-old uh, actress Mildred Harris, a decision he would soon come to regret, saying they were irreconcilably mismatched. Following the divorce, he married 16-year-old Lita Gray, another actress with whom he had a bitter breakup. From the first day of marriage, he made his perception about her clear and called her a little ooh whore. I hope you get what I'm saying there. On their train back to California from the marriage, Chaplin suggested Lita jump off the train to end her misery. Interestingly, Chaplin didn't like his wife, but according to her, he remained a human s machine. When she announced she was pregnant for the second time, his behavior got even more erratic. He would take up to eight showers a day and monitor the listening devices he had installed in her bedroom and patrol their house's grounds with a pistol at night. By the end of the same year, Lita headed for a divorce, stating how Chaplin had uh, pulled that same piece at her and threatened getting rid of her, what she had. Lita's more elaborated passages surfaced when she claimed how throughout the marriage life, Chaplin forced her to gratify his abnormal, unnatural, perverted, and degenerate sexual desires. Next on his list was 22-year-old actress Paulette Goddard. History doesn't have an exact record of the year they married, but she moved into his mansion and got cast as a leading actress in modern times. Charlie bullied her on sets, a primary reason for their separation, telling people how he had to teach her things about acting, and those remarks would leave her crying. And in 1943, while in the middle of a high-profile paternity suit, 54-year-old Chaplin married 18-year-old Una O'Neill, to whom he had been introduced by a Hollywood agent. O'Neill's father, playwright Eugene O'Neill, was so upset by the match that he disinherited her. But unlike his other relationships, this one actually lasted. The two stayed together until Chaplin's death at age 88, and they had eight descendants. Jeez, that's a lot of marriages. 
I'm technically cheating a little bit on the history word here, since Tom Cruise is one of the most recent names on this list, but I couldn't leave a high ranking Scientology member off of the uh, evil list. He has allegedly reached OT8, which is the highest currently achievable level of the cult. Uh, pardon me. As always, I'm getting ahead of myself. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices invented by Ron Hubbard, who developed a set of ideas that he called Dianetics, which he represented as a form of therapy. An organization that he established in 1950 to remote it went bankrupt, and he lost the rights to his book in 1952. But he then recharacterized his ideas as a religion for tax purposes and renamed them Scientology. By 1954, he had regained the rights to Dianetics and founded the Church of Scientology, which remains the largest organization promoting the cult. In 1967, he established a new elite group, the Sea Organization, or Sea Org for short, the membership of which was drawn from the most committed members of the church. By 1981, the 21-year-old David Miscavige, who had been one of his closest aides in Sea Org, rose to prominence. Now, Hubbard died at his ranch in Creston, California on January 24th of 1986, and Miscavige succeeded him as the head of the church, a position he holds till this day. It was actually at Tom Cruise's wedding day, to now ex-wife Katie Holmes, that people started realizing that Miscavige's wife Shelly was missing, and when a former Scientology member started asking around, she was punished for asking. There are just too many evil things about the cult for me to talk about right now, but you just gotta know that to be that high ranking at a cult, you gotta be evil. Number 8. Steve Jobs While I love and appreciate my iPod and the iPhones I've had over the years, Steve Jobs was no saint. In fact, his success can be attributed to his ruthless behavior, which is kind of commonplace with anybody that makes a billion dollars. In his biography, there are plenty of examples, from firing people at Pixar without notice, to storming out of a five-star hotel that he thought wasn't up to his standards, and berating service workers that he didn't consider up to his standards. Now, while that's all icky, you might be asking where the actual evil is, and don't worry, there's plenty. For starters, he not only neglected his daughter, Lisa Brennan Jobs, who he had with an ex-girlfriend, but he was also just like straight up rude and weird to her. Her In her memoir, Small Fry, she painted him like a jerk who once told her that she smelled like a toilet. However, the creepiest revelation was when Lisa revealed that Steve liked making out with his new wife right in front of her. So in the book, she describes Steve pulling in his wife for a kiss, moving his hand closer to her breasts while moaning theatrically, and when Lisa tried to excuse herself, Steve stopped her and told her to stay since they were having, in his words, a family moment. It's important that you try to be part of this family. Okay. Moving on before I hurl, probably his biggest evil moment though was when he cheated his friend and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak out of money. While the two worked together at Atari, Steve asked his partner to build a scaled down version of Breakout, saying they would split the profits. And after four sleepless nights, Wozniak finished the game and got a whopping $350 for it. He later learned that Steve had lied to him about how much money he made from the game and had actually pocketed most of the profits for himself. Honestly, that's the stuff movie moans get based on. Number 7. Albert Einstein After you invent the theory of relativity, I guess you can get away with being like a little bit of a jerk, and Albert definitely was. From being incredibly racist against Asians in his travel journals to being a serial adulterer. Travel diaries he wrote during a months long voyage in the 1920s reveal that in his private moments, the Nobel winning physicist portrayed people of other races, such as you know Chinese and Indians, in a stereotypical dehumanizing way. His unfiltered musings about the people he saw and interacted with during his journey show that, you know, eh, he harbored some pretty racist about those who didn't look like him. His reflections about the Chinese folks were callous, even insulting. Although he called them industrious, he also described them as filthy and obtuse. He claimed they were a peculiar, herd-like nation, often more like automatons than people. He saw them as intellectually inferior, quoting that the Chinese are incapable of being trained to think logically and have no talent for mathematics. He was also not the nicest of folks he allegedly loved, having created a baffling to-do list for his first wife, Maleva Mark. This list included rules such as, you will see to it that my clothes and linen are kept in order, that I am served three regular meals a day in my room, and you will expect no affection from me. You must leave my bedroom or study at once without protesting when I ask you to. Hard pass. Number six, John Hamm. Oh, the handsome Mad Max star has a lot of female fans that love his charm, but the actor, kind of like his famous character, is pretty good at hiding his dark side. In 2015, news broke that the former frat boy was in the middle of a violent hazing ritual in 1991 where he allegedly set a guy on fire. Not only did John beat up a pledge by punching him in the kidney, he also let the poor guy around the frat house with a claw of a hammer beneath his genitals. As for the pledge, the whole experience made him sink into a deep depression, which sadly makes sense. This broke my heart, because like until today, I very much enjoyed watching him on screen, but I guess I'll be able to build 
Helen is in bed around Sucker Punch now. At number five, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm just I'm not funny, I'll leave. Number 10, Joseph Mangeli. All right, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. This man is the only entry from the Second World War on today's list, and that's mainly because online guidelines make it practically impossible for me to talk about the evil German dictator or members of his party. So also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners at Auschwitz. So at Auschwitz, he was one of a number of medical professionals who selected victims to be sentenced to the gas chamber 
chambers or be spared for his experimental research. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to another, do amputations to try and sew that part onto another twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with typhus or another disease, and uh, way too many other experiments. Can you tell he liked twins? And to the surprise of no one, more often than not, the twins would pass away during the procedures, or you know, he would just have them killed afterwards so he could do an autopsy for funsies. If one twin died from a disease, yeah, the other one's going. Just to mark the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors, and he would uh, collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it off for research. He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. Now remember, this was before the age of colored contacts. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of research. Now he tried sex change operations, he tried removing organs, and operating on victims without anesthesia. Oh, and if that wasn't disgusting enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. Throughout his time at Auschwitz, Joseph sent his colleagues in Germany red fluid, body parts, organs, skeletons, and even fetuses that have been taken from prisoners. Yay. Number 9. Putin Well, Vladimir Putin started off reasonably well you know, in his career, although there are um, some stories that his cronies planted explosives in Russian apartment buildings to help him snatch that presidency back in 1999. Granted, the folks who tell those truths keep going missing, so I'll get the Cliff's Notes version and pray I don't get nuked on the spot. One month after then-President Boris Yeltsin plucked Putin from obscurity – oh, and by the way, he was a KGB official at the time, which, yeesh – and made him prime minister, an explosion leveled a nine-story apartment building on Moscow's outskirts. Sidebar, if you don't know what the KGB was other than me shuddering just now, they were a security agency that make all the other ones in the world look like young folks trying to enforce rules for funsies. The pre-dawn blast on September 9th of 1999 reduced the building to a smoking pile of rubble, killing more than 100 people. A second building, less than 600 kilometers away, was rocked by an explosion on September 13th killing 119 this time. Days earlier, a car exploded in a small town bordering the war-ravaged region of Chechnya, where reignited fighting was already spilling into neighboring regions. That blast outside the apartment building in the town of Buynask killed dozens. If I got the name wrong, I apologize. I'm not the best with every language. French and English are my forte for a reason. It was followed seven days later by a truck explosive that destroyed a nine-story building in another southern city, killing 17. On September 23rd, Putin asserted to the, you know, everybody, that bad guys in Chechnya were to blame and ordered a massive air campaign within the North Caucasus region. When asked a day later about the campaign targeting what he called terrorists, Putin responded with the phrase that will forever be his catchphrase, we will pursue them everywhere, we'll catch them in the toilet, we'll wipe them out in the outhouse. The statement became a Putin catchphrase and uh, set the tone for the 20 years of rule that followed. The longer he's in power, the more evil he's become, leveling Grozny, attacking Georgia, grabbing the Crimea, carpet kabooming in Syria, imprisoning, poisoning, and assassinating any opponents and, you know, muzzling the free press. When one would think, you know, oh, it can't get worse. Yeah, he had another surprise. The unprovoked attack of Ukraine, which, you know, an independent and peaceful nation back in February of 2022. But thanks to the heroism of the Ukrainian people, it's not completely the walkover he expected. So fingers crossed he maybe gets uh, voted out in the next election. Granted, it's a little tricky when people who oppose him have that weird coincidental habit of going missing. Number 8. Korean Kims It's pretty difficult to distinguish between these two evil leaders, father and son, of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's a country led by a dictator where the people have no say, and a monarchy with the father being succeeded by the son. Over time, there's actually been three Kims in that family that suggests that uh, being evil might just be like a generational thing, you know, part of your genetics, kind of like having an oily nose is one of mine. Under Papa Kim Yong II, aka the Dear Leader, which is a bucket of irony I don't have time to unpack, millions of folks died because of food scarcity. Amnesty International condemned him for leaving millions of North Koreans in poverty and detaining hundreds of thousands of people in prison camps, where, yeah, a lot of them died. Now, baby-faced Kim Jong-un was not much of an improvement. Human rights are non-existent, and his true or imagined opponents, or people he just doesn't like, are killed with methods that are going to give me nightmares for the rest of the year. While the general population suffers, the Kims spend whatever money they have on the development of nuclear weapons, because you know, why not just make things worse? Number 7. Dr. Phil First, it's very important to understand that Dr. Phil is not a real doctor anymore. While he does have a PhD
PhD in psychology and used to have a license, he is no longer a licensed psychologist and cannot legally practice in the state of California, where he lives and films a show. Now, emphasis on used to. Look, while I can't state with certainty why he is no longer licensed, if you go back to 1988, a decade before his first appearance on Oprah, a 19 year old client of his alleged that he carried on an unprofessional sexual relationship with her, would touch her inappropriately, and intentionally kept her totally dependent on him. The Texas State Board of Examiners of Psychologists, try saying that five times fast, investigated the accusations, along with claims that Dr. Phil inappropriately provided this young lady with part time temporary employment while still carrying on a therapeutic relationship. Their findings never referenced the accusations of sexual misconduct, but they did discover that the doctor sustained an improper dual relationship with the client by acting both as her therapist and her employer. The board issued him a letter of reprimand, assigned a psychologist to monitor his practice, and required him to take an ethics class and a complete psychological evaluation. Whatever the reason may be, Phil McGraw is no longer a licensed psychologist and he hasn't been for quite a while. He believes that his show's primary goal is to let people know that it's okay to treat problems and get help, and deliver understandable information about how to live one's life. Which, you know, that's a cute soundbite and all. But Dr. Phil's show regularly exploits people with serious mental illnesses and disabilities for financial and entertainment purposes, if you can even call that entertainment. In one instance, Todd Herzog, a former winner of the hit reality TV show Survivor, appeared on the show in 2013 to discuss his drinking problem. However, he was so drunk that he had to be carried onto the set and lifted into a chair. Before you wonder why a supposedly trained psychologist is something so cruel as to put a man too drunk to walk on national TV, first consider the horrendously immoral and unethical actions that led to this situation. According to Herzog, he was set up. His dressing room came with a full bottle of, um, Spicy juice. After drinking all of it, a staff member supposedly handed him a Xanax, which he took before he even went on stage. Which, all of this doesn't even scrape the surface of the accusations of misconduct and bad psychology that have followed Dr. Phil throughout his career. If I were to say all of those, I'd be here all day. Number six, Osama bin Laden. Yeah, he doesn't really need an introduction. Remember 9 11? Yeah, he was the organizer and mastermind, sending himself and way too many innocents to their death. He became America's most wanted, and justice was, you know, finally served on May 2nd of 2011 at 1 a.m. Thank you, Navy C. They also found um, a huge stash of no-no tapes in his compound, because apparently the self-righteous threat persecuting women for being loose was not above sampling the strictly condemned fruits himself. Number 5. Arming Squire Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were 7 years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for 7 more years. And then at age 14, quick maths, at age 14 you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. Guy was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls. Keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistance. 
so that it's their assistance. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed, I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the Dark Ages, this rule was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this rule was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box because porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you won't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this rule? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this rule. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay. Thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it. That's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right? Not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar. Eh, doesn't matter, we're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a Hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years. You're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay. It's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go. You may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good. I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year. Couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever. That's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings. Would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now, just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens lists is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like, these gals were absolutely ruthless, and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like, ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries, and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene, who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1830. 36 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise 
surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is, until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off. But a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carried that pain with them as much as Catherine de' Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble, very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtid. 
The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner, and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number 4, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here, too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics, and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queasy at night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time aside in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was opposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action, and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number nine, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler, and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the 
the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But I didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. 
She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack, and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous, and honestly, I'm the youngest of my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Number 10, history. 
ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC. Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion, so how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshephut, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdu El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the Lost Queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin Bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, it's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head like that's really but three years later officials decided to release that to the public So here it is. Take a look Queen Nefertiti 3d bust Scanned by James Bond secretly number seven monuments men it wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in German's hands through the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold Gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After 
after radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasures, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, 
what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them, and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in men. Medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, he's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7. Party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part 2's for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role. 
role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. <laughs> Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back, I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rock the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of this list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, it's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. 
and was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. And later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think? At number 10, royal enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse, the horse was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, 
One of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all, all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. Number 5. Bill Cosby It emerged in late 2014 that the famed actor, formerly known as America's Dad, sexually harmed dozens of women throughout his career. Cosby was accused by over 60 women of bad things that I can't word. The earliest incidents allegedly took place in the mid-1960s, but dates of the alleged incidents continue all the way up to 2008 in 10 US states and in one Canadian province. Now, Cosby has maintained his innocence and repeatedly denied the allegations made against him. Most of the alleged acts fall outside the statute of limitations for criminal legal proceedings, but criminal charges were filed against him in one case, and numerous civil lawsuits were brought against him. As of November 2018, I believe eight related silver suits were active. In July of 2015, some court records were unsealed and released to the public from a specific civil suit, and a full transcription of its deposition was released by a court reporting service. In his testimony, Cosby admitted to casual sex involving recreational use of the sedative quaaludes with a series of young women, and he acknowledged that his dispensing of the prescription drug was illegal. In December of that year, three Class II felony charges of aggravated indecent harm were filed against Cosby in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, based on allegations concerning incidents in January of 04. Now, Cosby was found guilty of three counts of aggravated indecent harm at retrial on April 26th of 2018, and on September 25th of the same year, he was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in state prison and fined $25,000 plus the cost of the prosecution. So, 43,000 something? In 2014, Judy Huth filed a civil suit against Cosby in California, alleging that he had her in 1975 when she was too young to consent. That trial began in 2022, and thankfully the jury ruled in Huth's favor. So, good riddance. Number four, Elvis. Although everyone knows he famously met wife Priscilla Presley when she was only 14, that wasn't the only time he fraternized with folks that were a little too young. According to a former member of his entourage, Elvis was fascinated with the idea of real young girls. He was particularly obsessed with Virginia ones, which he called cherries, and excuse me while I retch. According to Baby Let's Play House, Elvis felt insecure about pleasing older women. Woman, and would invite groups of young fans to his house for sleepovers instead. And once he met Priscilla, those fantasies didn't change. Determined to keep her virginal until their wedding day, uh, he would instead have role play sessions where she would dress up like a schoolgirl and he would dress up like a teacher. Once the two married and had their first spawn, however, 
escapades stopped. Priscilla wrote in her memoir that Elvis had mentioned to her before they were married that he had never been able to make love to a woman who had given birth. When Elvis finally upgraded to adult woman, dating 21 year old beauty queen Ginger Eldon after his divorce from Priscilla, he continued to treat them like crap. Ginger wrote in her memoir that Elvis once fired a pistol into her bedroom when she refused to bring him yogurt. Lovely. Number three, Vlad the Impaler. Also known as Vlad Dracula, he was Prince of Wallachia three times between 1448 and his death in around 1476 or 77. The character of Dracula was loosely based on Vlad due to his sadistic personality and cruel acts done to the people of Wallachia, where he reigned as prince three times between 1448 to 1462 and killed about oh, only 20% of the population. Works containing the stories about Vlad's cruelty were published in Low German in the Holy Roman Empire before 1480. They described Vlad as a demented psycho path, a gruesome killer, and a masochist Caligula and Nero. One tale explains that Vlad had a big copper cauldron built and put a lid made of wood with holes in it on top. He put people in the cauldron and put their heads in the holes and fastened them there. He then filled it with water and set a fire under it and let people cry their eyes out until they were boiled to death. And you know, he invited just overall frightening, terrible, unheard of punishments. He ordered that women be impaled together with their suckling young on the same stake, stuck on their mother's breasts until they died. Then he had the woman's breast cut off and put the little ones inside head first, thus he had them impaled together. Together, he impaled victims through the um, rear end till the steak came out of their mouth. A German pamphlet once read that he had young folks roasted and then he would feed them to their mothers and he cut off the breasts of women and forced their husbands to eat them. You know, nightmare cruelty. Number two, Hugh Hefner. While it might not seem shocking that the man who claimed woman empowerment came from seeing them in bunny suits through the male gaze, you know, being a bad guy, just how awful he was may raise some eyebrows. He manipulated and drugged dozens of young women into taking part in black while masquerading as a champion of freedom. He would also host weekly pig nights, during which he would bring in a dozen Schmex workers he considered ugly to have friends. Holly Madison, you know, a lovely woman who dated Hefner for eight years, told how Hefner refused to use protection during and how the Playboy Bunny lifestyle had her considering taking her own life. Linda Loveless, the 1970s um, adult video star who found fame with the film Deep Throat, said she was treated like a piece of meat and forced to perform oral German Shepherd while Hefner and his friends watched. I could go into more detail, but I don't think I want to. Number one, Gandhi. Yeah, sure, he was an activist who led India to independence, but it also turns out that he was kind of a In the book, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, it was revealed that Gandhi was a separatist who wrote to the natal parliament that general belief seems to prevail in the colony that the Indians are a little better, if at all, than savages or the natives of Africa. He later wrote to a health officer in Johannesburg that he was concerned about the mixing of the South Africans with the Indians. If that wasn't awful enough, he frequently used his power to take advantage of young women in their late teens and early 20s. His inappropriate behavior was so bad, it caused his personal secretary, R.P. Paris Suram to blast him in a strongly worded letter. Now, his secretary gave him an ultimatum. Either stop manhandling woman or I'm not working for you anymore. And Gandhi responded by telling him that uh, you're at liberty to leave. Yucky. And that brings us to the end of our time and goodness gracious, fame ain't all it's made out to be, I suppose. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Logan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed, agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? 
A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up. Tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course. But tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think that's a noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashion accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is there so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot. Get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes. So spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, Caligula. Many Roman emperors can be described as self-centered, but this one's appetite for amusement, decadence, and scarlet elixir were on a whole other level. The emperor's short temper and even shorter attention span resulted in countless deaths of his subjects. Caligula killed people for just Funsies. In one particularly vile uh, situation, he even ordered his guards to put spectators in an arena to be eaten by wild animals because he was bored during a, you know, an intermission. I just lose hours scrolling on TikTok and playing silly games on my phone when I get bored, which, you know, isn't often. The emperor was indulgent and purposely wasted money, which led to starvation amongst his subjects. He openly slept with married women and sold his sisters to other men, which I guess seems kind of mild after having people killed to kill your own boredom, but, you know, simply put, he was scummy. Number four, Jim Jones. As if I was going to do a list of the worst men in history and not include a single cult leader. So back in the 1950s, Indiana native Jim Jones founded the People's Temple, a group that he claimed promoted socialism and equality with religious elements of Christianity. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, he moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its main headquarters in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though three to 5,000 is probably more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be outside the potential danger zone. The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to uh, see what was going on. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with them and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Ketuma. There they were intercepted by self-styled 
temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing the congressman, three journalists, and one of the defectors as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spire. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists that were sadly killed in the attack. But that evening in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a concoction of cyanide laced, grape flavored flavorate. Oh, right, this is where the phrase drinking the Kool Aid comes from, but it actually wasn't Kool Aid, it was the off brand stuff. All in all, 918 people died, including 276 minors. When members wept and showed signs of dissent, Jones counseled, Stop the hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialists or communists to die. No way for us to die, we must die with some dignity. On a tape, Jones can be heard saying, Don't be afraid to die, adding that death is just stepping over into another plane and a friend. Jones directed that the youngest folks be killed first, and his wife Marceline apparently protested against this. Uh, so then she was forcibly restrained and then joined the other adults in poisoning herself. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink. And some folks thankfully did survive by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9 11, this was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to think about. Number three, Pol Pot. This vile leader of the Khmer Rouge regime was the architect of the Cambodian genocide and devastating policies that led to widespread famine and deaths from preventable diseases. The regime's xenophobic and racist views and policies led to the widespread killings of minorities all throughout Cambodia. The regime also imprisoned and destroyed those who opposed it. Prisoners were subjected to horrific medical experiments, which often resulted in agonizingly drawn out deaths. Many prisoners, including those too young to consent, were executed in the infamous killing fields and buried in mass graves. To save bullets, they were killed with pickaxes or smashed against trees, which is so much worse. Now, Pol Pot and the regime ended the lives of between 1.5 to 2 million Cambodian citizens, a quarter of the country's population. The most mind boggling part for me is wondering how this wasn't taught in school, or at least my school growing up. Number two, Chris Brown. If y'all don't remember, 14 years ago on on the February 8th of 2009, Brad's reputation was immediately tarnished when he physically harmed his then girlfriend Rihanna after a pre Grammys event. At the time, Rihanna was only 20 and she was left with visible injuries to her face and was hospitalized as a result. Now, Chris Brown was 19 at the time and he pleaded guilty and accepted a deal of 1,400 hours of community service, five years probation, and domestic violence counseling. And look, while folks try to defend him, he wouldn't have made today's list if he was a single instance offender. But let's check the history book, shall we? In 2013, Chris Brown was arrested for felony any harm in Washington DC after he and his bodyguard were involved in a physical altercation with two men outside a hotel. The pair spent 36 hours in jail and the singer was ordered to stay at least 100 yards away from the man he was accused of harming. In 2015, Brown allegedly hit a man in Las Vegas after an alleged argument over a basketball game at the Palms Casino Resort. The next year he was sued by his ex-manager who filed a lawsuit against him claiming that he had been viciously attacked. And in 2017, he was ordered to stay away from ex-girlfriend Karushi Tron after she put a 5 year restraining order order against the singer. He's been sued by other women for sexual harm as well, so how he still has some sort of a successful career boggles my mind. Number 1. Louis B. Mayer This is one name I didn't even have to look up today. As a lifelong fan of Judy Garland, I've had a bone to pick with him for quite some time. So in front of his staff, Mayer presented a calm, paternal presence. But behind closed doors, he was known for temper tantrums complete with loud sobbing and furious ranting. Most terrifying of all, these rages would go as quickly as they came and then he would put his icy mask back on. Textbook signs of narcissism, trust me. Elizabeth Taylor famously clashed with him constantly and dubbed him a monster for the way he tried to rule every detail of her life. Now, Some of the worst allegations against Mayer come from Judy Garland. According to her, Mayer frequently groped her and made her sit on his lap. At other times, he would innocently place his hand on her left breast to show her how to sing from the heart. Oh, and this was when she was just a teen. He was particularly awful to Judy, calling her his little hunchback because of her short stature and curved spine and encouraged her to take diet pills to slim down and look less girlish. Thanks in part to his actions, Judy was plagued with eating disorders and insecurities all the way until her tragic early end.